We'll be reading from the 10th chapter. And actually, I know in the bulletin it says 11 through 18, but surprise, we're not going to read all 11 through, uh, I mean, 11 through 25. We're going to read 10 through 14 and then 19 through 25. It, it will be on the screens behind me if you don't have your Bible. And so let's begin in the 10th verse together. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands day by day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifice that can never take away sin. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool footstool from his feet for his feet for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified now down to verse 19 therefore my friends since we have confidence we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus by the live the living and new way that he has opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh and since we have a great priest over the house of God let us approach with a true heart in the full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for, we, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of son. Some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but I kind of have a love hate relationship with my passwords on all my the program. You know, it seems like everything we do today, you have to have a password. And, and even worse, you have to have an account name and a password. And, and used to, I could use the same password and the same account name, but now they want, some of them want different characters or different things. And, and it just, it's a nightmare to keep up with them. My wife fusses at me all the time because I try to keep everything in my brain. And she says, that's not very safe. And so uh, we, you know, she said, why don't you put them in the notes in your phone? Well, I wished I had done that for my Facebook account because about a year and a half ago, I had to open a new Facebook account because not only could I not find the password, I couldn't even think of the email or the account name that it was in. But, you know, there's some great things happening in this, uh, this uh, password-driven world. On our phones now, it has face recognition. And I can open an account, and hopefully my face doesn't. Of course, I have found if I have my reading glasses on, it won't recognize my face. But, hey, what a great thing. I always have my face with me. And then my computer, it remembers me. Just It asks me every time I start one, it says, do you want to remember this? And I say, remember me. So now, I, so, so sometimes I'll be looking for something, I can't find it. I just wait till I get to my computer and it always remembers me and I get on that account. Well, this morning we're, the preacher in Hebrews is actually speaking to a group who's having memory issues. They have kind of forgotten their password or better yet, they've forgotten who they are and how they've gotten there. And a lot of them are trying to regress and go back to, to the way it was before. And, and maybe it's just like some of us, there may be just saying, hey, we've never done it this way before, so we want to go back to where we're comfortable. Because the preacher begins to immediately say, do you not remember the steam, the, the stream of steady stream of day-by-day day priests coming to bear gifts of animals and, and various kinds that are presented by the priest. 
They come bringing sacrifices for purification, for, for all kinds of things to make restitution to, for God, to God for you. You come from every corner of the earth and, and bring these gifts and, and then you hand them over to your priest and, and the priest goes in and, and to the altar and, well, he goes to at least the altar, but only once a year does a priest go into the Holy of Holies, to the main altar. And it's no ordinary priest. It's only the high priest that can go once a year. And that's on the Day of Atonement. On that Day of Atonement, the high priest would cleanse himself and, and make an offering for himself and, and, and his family. And, and then he would tie a rope around his waist and, and he would enter into the Holy of Holies. You may ask, a rope around his waist? Why a rope around his waist? Well, the rope was there in case he entered the Holy of Holies and God's presence was there and he came face to face with God and he knew that he would drop dead in that moment. And the rope was there so the other priest who couldn't go in beyond the curtain could pull him out of the uh, Holy of Holies. But it was only that once a year that the high priest would make his way in. He would sprinkle blood from the animals on the mercy seat and he would be there to offer the sacrifice. And, and then when he came out, he would walk out and there would be another lamb that would be there in, in that moment and he would tie a red ribbon around the neck of, of the goat and, and they would lay their hands upon it and then they would let it go, release it out in the wilderness. You've heard the term scapegoat? That's where it came from. Because that goat represented the sins of the people being cast out. But you know, all this happened once a year on the Day of Atonement. This ritual was great. The priests were busy not only that day, but they were busy every day bringing sacrifices over and over. And you know why? Because those sacrifices lasted no longer than the smoke that took their sin up into heaven. And the next day, they would have to come again. They were useless. The priest could shed the blood of all the animals there, make their offerings and their prayers, engage in their rituals from first morning light until the middle of the night, and it was no good. As a matter of fact, Hosea writes these words, and this is God speaking, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. We hear those words over and over again in the prophets. Burnt offerings do not cleanse the people from sin or bring salvation. The ritual didn't work. Sin, like a bad penny, just keeps turning up. But that's when it happened. That's when God sent a high priest the one that is human, but he's born from above. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is the one, the one to offer a way of forgiveness and bring it to completion. You know, forgiveness, and it's the first point on your outline, begins at the foot of the cross. Listen to verse 10 again. And it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Simply put, there's, there's no other way to address or to atone for our sin. I mean, you know, we can actually go out and ask somebody for forgiveness, somebody that we've wronged, and, and if we can find them, we can go ask them. And there's a tremendous healing that takes place. But, but what about the situations where it's impossible to seek out somebody that you've hurt or it would cause too much more pain around you if you confess that moment 
What then? You know, it's a difficult problem, isn't it? Medication can't fix it. Positive thinking cannot pick, fix it. The stain of sin is on our souls and there's not enough animals to sacrifice. Hail Mary's to say, there is no place to find forgiveness except at the foot of the cross. Chuck Colson in one of his books actually tells of an interview about a man named Albert, Albert Speer. He was on ABC's Good Morning America. Some of you may have heard that name, Albert Spears. Uh, what was unique about it, Spears was one of Hitler's confidants during, during the, uh, the Second World War. He, his ingenuity actually kept all the factories moving and producing. But something else that really set him apart of the 24 people that were tried at Nuremberg, Speer was the only one who stood up and confessed that he was guilty. As a matter of fact, he was sentenced to 20 years for that guilty plea. And, and, and after that time, he was free. And, and David Hartman actually asked him this question. You have said that the guilt can never be forgiven or shouldn't be. Do you still feel this way? Colson says, I'll never forget the look on Spears' face when he responded. He said, I served 20 years, a, a sentence of 20 years, and, and I could say I'm a free man. My conscience has been clearing, cleared by serving the whole time as punishment. But I can't do that. I still carry the burden of what happened to millions of people during Hitler's lifetime. And I can't get rid of it. This book that I've written is my atoning, my clearing of my conscience. And Hartman pressed him on the point, you really don't think you'll be able to clear it totally? And Spear shook his head and dropped his head. I don't think it will ever be possible. Chuck Colson said he wished beyond a, all measure that he could have sat down with Mr. Spear and had a conversation. But Mr. Spear died shortly after that interview before he could set it up. Because Chuck Colson said, I wanted to tell him about the power of the cross and the forgiveness that is offered in that moment. You know, so many of us know the power of the cross. We realize there is no forgiveness unless we face it and kneel down before that gift. There's the beginning of forgiveness. And Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Listen to verse 12 and verse 14. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Do you hear it? It's by his blood that we are cleansed, forgiven, and claimed as one of God's very own. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice for our sin. Did you hear the difference? The other priests go day by day, yet when Jesus made his sacrifice, what did he do? Did you hear what the writer said? He sat down. That's a powerful statement to think about. Everybody else is still working around trying to take care of it. But Jesus says the job is done. There's no more animals that need to be slaughtered. No more rituals that need to be replaced. No work on the part of humans are necessary. Jesus sat down and he rested because he knew his work was done. It was finished. That's it. That's the power. Sin no longer carries its sting. Sin no longer has its power because Jesus has spoken. He has paid the price and now he is sitting at the right hand of his heavenly father. The perfect sacrifice. 
has once and for all shed his blood so that you and I could be forgiven. Forgiveness is offered. The door's been opened. The bridge has been built. Therefore, brothers and sisters, our challenge is to quit looking back and remember what Jesus has done for us as we walk across that bridge that he built and and begin to live out a loving and grace-filled relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now we can, we can approach God with boldness. Listen to verse 19 again. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus. The preacher's reminding them of what happened on the day that Jesus breathed his last breath. You remember Matthew tells us, Mark tells us, Luke tells us, Jesus drew his last breath. He exhaled at that moment. And in that moment, everything went dark. And remember the, the curtain that blocked the people from the Holy of Holies was torn from top to bottom so that it was opened up. And in that moment, the, the, the curtain that separated us from God is gone. And now we can come with boldness to God. In essence, our prayers can be heard. We can stand in his presence because we stand in his presence because as we stand there and cry out to God, Jesus is sitting beside him at his right hand saying, hey, Father, I know them. They are mine. And it's in that moment we can come with boldness to the altar knowing that God hears our prayers and he has set us free and allowed us to move forward with boldness. But then the preacher actually says, we must hold fast to the confession of faith without wavering. That's a mouthful in one sentence, isn't it? Listen to verse 22 and 23. Let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. Sounds good, doesn't it? But those of us sitting in this room know it sounds a lot better than it's, and it's a lot easier to hear than it is to live it out. You know, so many times in life we we waver at decisions that we make or or we sit down and we calculate all the risks before we decide or or we, we waver as we check out all the angles before we step out to face the challenge. Yet the preacher of Hebrews is, is challenging us all to hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Jesus died for us. He offered himself as a sacrifice for us. He has cleansed us of his sins. Ask him for the strength to aid you as you seek to live your lives in faithfulness. Ask his Holy Spirit to fill you once again so that even though you've given it all to the poor, or even though you're dealing with the loss of a loved one, or even though you're sitting in the middle of pain, you will not waver. Not because of your strength, because of the one who has given it all is faithful and just. He is the perfect sacrifice. And he came so that you and I may have new life. And then we are to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Listen to verse 24. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Three-year-old boy was having his birthday party and his grandmother showed up with this great raft 
wrapped gift. And when she gave it to him, he opened it up, tore through it. And guess what? It was one of the best, biggest, baddest water soakers you've ever seen. You know, one of those that you fill up with water and everybody gets wet when you start spraying it. He couldn't stand. He forgot about all the other gifts. Typical little boy went running into the kitchen, pushed a chair up to the sink, climbed up in the chair, turned on the faucet, and began to fill up this water soaker that was as big as he was and filled it to the top. And you can imagine, he started spraying everybody. His dad looked at his mother and said, Mom, do you not remember how you hated it when we were kids and we got water pistols? And with a wicked smile on her face, she said, Yes, I do remember. You know, when I hear the word provoke, that's what I think of. So it, it's, it's a struggle for me to hear that, that we're going to provoke somebody. We're going we're to provoke somebody into doing something, but, you know, especially into loving good words, because I, I hear it in a negative context. But, you know, I looked at some other translations and they made more sense. In the NIV, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as, as some are doing in the hab, are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. So I think the writer of Hebrews is, is reminding us of something that's important that I think we've forgotten. I think we have become so individualistic as a nation and as a church that we've forgotten the power and the importance of community. Of what happens when we come into this place. We come here to encourage, to spur, to provoke one another to loving good deeds. In, in, in essence, what do we do? We're called to jab one another, to poke one another, to provoke one another to loving good deeds. It, it's giving each other the courage to step out in the middle of fear, in the middle of a struggle, or in the middle of pain, and, and to live life that God intends for us to live. That's why it's so important for us to, to be a part of a, a small group or a Sunday morning group. You know, the truth of it is you can come to worship and you can hide. I've seen people do it for years. You know, you slip in at the right moment. You slip out at the right moment. You can even beat the preacher to the back if you're really good. You know, you just kind of come and you get and you go. But when you get in a small group or a Sunday morning group, you get to know those people and you start to understand that they are truly your brothers and sisters. And it's in that fellowship that you can begin to encourage, to provoke, to spur one another on in the middle of life. Because we all know what it is. On some Sundays, it's been a good week for you, but the person you're sitting next to, everything's gone wrong. And maybe it's in that moment that you need to be there to encourage them and to strengthen them. You know, I've, I've even seen it happen in worship. I've seen people walk in and, and you can tell they almost don't want to be there this Sunday that, that maybe they're mad about something and, and they, they've come into the place but then they see somebody else in worship who, who is actually worshiping and, and maybe lifting their hands or, or saying amen or, or clapping for those that are there and, and before they know it, you've drawn them, you've encouraged them, you've provoked them into worshiping and, and, and when they leave this place, things are different than they were before. You know, the best example and what taught me this was a group of ladies in a disciple Bible study. I was the token man in that group because I was the only one. But it was after Chris and I lost our, or had a miscarriage. And, and, and it was a couple of weeks after that and things were still pretty raw. And, and I walked in one Sunday and I said, listen, ladies, I'm sorry. I'm not prepared. Y'all just forgive me and we'll get through this. And, and, and we kept talking and, and I said, you know, right now I'm even struggling to pray because the truth of it was I was pretty mad at God. 
And I'll never forget this. One of the ladies looked, and she kind of pointed her hand, finger at me, and she said, listen, preacher, it's time for you to sit back and let us pray for you, and you just hold on. That was the most powerful statement I'd ever heard. Because I realized even though I was the preacher, well, I was the associate preacher, so I wasn't a full preacher, I guess. But, you know, but to her, I was the preacher. All I had to do was hold on because they were there praying for me. You know, that's what it's about. You don't think it's important that you are not here on a Sunday? Guess what? That may be the day that God has set aside because somebody else is holding on and they need you to be there to encourage them. Or it may be a Sunday you don't want to come because you're just holding on and you're holding on by the fingernails and, and you want to let go. But you walk into this place and you don't want to be here. And then there they are. Somebody that's there to encourage you, to provoke you, to spur you on in the middle of that moment to love and good deeds. There's power in community. There's strength when we are together with our brothers and sisters. You know, I, I think it's almost perfect that the preacher sets up his next sermon with this one. Because his next sermon, if you know the book of Hebrews, is where he starts to talk about the heroes of faith. All of those who have gone before us, those heroes that are there, that have been there and have lived their lives in faith and, and they've lived it out in acts of love and of kindness. And, and then he gets to verse to, to chapter 12 and he says, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded every time we walk into this place, not just by the brothers and sisters who are sitting here with us, but all of those who are sitting up above us and are looking now from heaven, those who have gone before us that were a part of this community, but also a part of the extended community, our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're looking down upon us. They are encouraging us. They are strengthening us. They are challenging us to move forward. And, and they're calling us to lay aside the weight, the sin that clings so closely, that anchor that's holding us back so that we can run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking always to Jesus. The perfect sacrifice. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith. See, Jesus has come to set things right. Now we are called to live in the confidence that he is faithful. To be bold and know that he is on our side. And we are called to spur one another on. To provoke one another to love and good deeds. That's the password that we're searching for. And the password's name is Jesus. This morning, as Ronnie comes and leads us in our closing hymn, I remind you this altar is open to anyone who would like to come forward and have a word of prayer. The doors of this church are open to anyone who'd like to unite with this church as we stand together and sing.